everyone. I'm Nicole Forbes with Dennis's 70s, and today we are talking about culinary herbs. This is one of, again, my favorite topics. I guess the truth is I love to just talk about plants, so um, every time I say it's my favorite topic, it's the truth, um, but I have a lot of favorite topics. Uh, growing herbs, though, is uh, a great thing to do for novice gardeners. Or even people that aren't gardeners. I mean, do you eat food, right? Then spice it up, grow some herbs. And nothing more exciting than dashing out at the last minute and grabbing a satchel or a, a t-shirt full of fresh snippings from edible, flavorful herbs in your garden, bringing them back in and kind of adding just the last, um, at the last bit of cooking, a little flavorful pizzazz to your meal. So, uh, Let's talk about herbs. One of the um, kind of general statements that we can make about herbs as a whole <clears throat> is that they are, as a group of plants, they are relatively low in their needs and their, their basic requirements. Um, they're thrifty, they're not, and most herbs aren't heavy feeders or really needy. They don't develop a lot of insect or disease issues and most herbs tolerate growing even in fairly poor soil. Now, um, poor soil doesn't mean that they're gonna grow in a swamp. Um, most herbs will benefit from well-draining soil, and a lot of the herbs that we use on our regular kind of culinary menu are Mediterranean uh, in their, their uh, heritage or where they come from. So even better for well-draining soil for those Mediterranean herbs. But in addition to being kind of low needs, uh, as far as plants are concerned, herbs are also, uh, in general, drought tolerant, which also kind of goes back to a lot of that Mediterranean parentage that they have. Um, they're adapted to drought conditions very well. So drought tolerant, which again creates um, a little bit lighter footprint for us in the garden. We have to water them less. They require less resources to grow. And beyond that, with very few insects and diseases, we're rarely needing to um, spray or do any kind of treatment with herbs. Um, even by nature, they, for the most part, herbs are, a lot of herbs are deer resistant, uh, just by their, their high flavor and scent content can, can repel deer and rabbits and things. So a lot of herbs are left alone by critters. And the one critter, so to speak, that is attracted to herbs is our whole group of pollinators. Um, so bees, uh, even hummingbirds, and a lot of our other invertebrates and pollinators that we love to see in our gardens are attracted to the flowers that come uh, at some point in most herb life cycle. So um, we'll talk about that again kind of as we go through some of these various, some of our favorite herbs to grow and when they do go to flower, you know, what do you do or uh, whether or not that affects their flavor because sometimes it does. But no matter what, the herb flower is an attractant uh, to the pollinators, which can help bring them into your garden to pollinate even the rest of your uh, edible vegetable crop, for example. So when we really start talking about growing herbs in our garden, there are just like almost any other kind of group of plants that we start talking about, there are annual herbs that we replant, at least in the Portland metro area, we replant basil, um, we replant cilantro, uh, dill. Every year we put those plants back in our gardens because they run their course in a single season and die in the frost. So these are what we would consider annual herbs. Um, basil, as a lot of you have probably recently purchased, um, or some of you may be wait, waiting for a little bit warmer weather to put your basil out, um, basil is one of those just classic summer herbs. Um, the, the caprese salad wouldn't be the same without it. Summer wouldn't be summer without, you know, a pot of basil on your back deck, a little pesto, um, just that, that perfect fresh flavor and the aroma of basil, which is hard to capture in a dried herb. So that's one of the reasons why basil is so special is because it's hard to, to uh, keep beyond the, the fresh seeds. The annual herbs, though, are um, 
among you in our kind of herb family, the, a lot of our most favorite herbs are perennial, um, quite hardy, and quite a few of them are even evergreen. So they're there even all winter long for you to go and add to um, soups and casseroles and dishes like that. So uh, starting with, of course, um, the, those annual herbs, like I said, basil. I've got some basil out today. I do know a few people who have put basil out over the last couple of weeks fully exposed to some nighttime temperatures that have been in the mid 40s, maybe upper 40s. Um, basil's not very happy with that. Combined with some of the rain that we've gotten, um, your basil may be looking a little, uh, a little worn out already in the season. And so I say if you have actually um, put it out and it's starting to show signs of cold damage, it's probably a good idea to wait a few weeks and then come buy more basil to replant. Um, in warmer weather, the basil's gonna do a lot better. So if you do buy it early, you could put it in a nice little pot or a container and then have it close to the house, um, somewhere up near the porch uh, where it's close to the house, keeps it warmer, and even a little porch or roof overhang, which could kind of control the amount of moisture or water that falls on it from rain. That's gonna keep the basil a little bit happier. And basil does like looser, uh, looser soil than a lot of our heavy clay. So I often find that basil just grows better in a pot altogether. These terracotta, just kind of rough clay pots, are great for growing herbs. Um, lots of us may have kind of a random stack or collection of them. Uh, we sell a great selection of them at Dennis 7 bs but honestly, uh, garage sales, estate sales, everybody's usually getting rid of terracotta pots. So um, you can, for, you know, Spend your money on the herbs, um, find some great containers to grow them in so that you have them close to the house. That even is an advantage. Now there's all a couple of different varieties of basil. The most popular is the Genovese or sweet basil. Um, this is a fairly large leaf basil with you know that traditional classic um, basil or pesto basil flavor. But we also have Thai basil, uh, which is a smaller leafed variety and a little bit more of an anise type flavor, a little bit of a cinnamony flavor to the Thai basil. And you know, because basil is used in so many different foods, uh, you'll have that kind of effective flavor differences if you use Thai basil, maybe on your pizza, it might be a little off flavor for what you would expect for that Italian classic basil flavor, but the Thai basil thrown into um, a stir fry or you know, a noodle dish will be fantastic for that. Uh, more Asian effect of the basil with the, the dishes flavors. Now basil, <clears throat> and again I'll say this several times while talking about herbs, basil is one of those herbs that we sometimes struggle with, not only because we put it out early, but because uh, it, re it reacts to kind of a change in temperature. And we all know that change in temperature is what we're waiting for too. We react by you know wearing our shorts and flip flops and spending more time outside. But as the, as the weather warms, basil can um, have some stresses from that kind of adjustment or change in temperature. And often uh, its tendency is to begin to flower. Um, as, just a res as a result of that stress, it decides it's gonna flower, go to seed in case anything happens, then it's kind of reassured the next generation of basil is gonna survive, right? That's a seed. And so <clears throat> to slow or to kind of prevent that seed and flower formation, which changes the flavor of basil, the best thing to do is to pinch it back and trim it often and use the basil frequently. Um, so it's uh, easy to snip a longer stemmed piece of basil, for example, maybe a you know couple of three, four inch couple of sprigs like this, if you go out and cut these off of your plant, that's gonna be a nice kind of uh, compact uh, shortening or making the plant a little bit more compact. Now, if you bring in a couple of these to the house and maybe you don't use them all, you can put this little sprig of basil into a small juice glass or even a shot glass with water in it and either store it on, uh, you know, out of the direct sun and on a kitchen counter or even put it into the refrigerator um, and they'll store for several days. I have actually seen little sprigs of basil like this actually grow roots if they spend long enough time on my kitchen counter. 
And then that basil is one that you could even then regrow. Um, so put it into water once it's formed roots and now you have more basil. So if you also uh, pick more than you're gonna eat right away, most of these fresh herbs can be easily preserved in a little bit of oil and make like a quick pesto with it. So, um, you know, if you're not growing your own herbs, you know what you have to do, right? You have to go to the store and you have to find those plastic coffins of fresh herbs for like four fifty for more than you need for your recipe. And then you've got leftover, what, fennel or tarragon or something sitting in the fridge and you're not using it again because that you didn't have it in stock or in your cupboard, you know, and here it is left over. So those herbs can be chopped up real quick, thrown into some oil, zipped into a blender and created a, a you know, into kind of a pesto mix. That can be spread on omelets, on sandwich bread, um, using those fresh herbs. You'll find all kinds of places where you can add herbs into your daily life. I have herbs in the morning with omelets or eggs. I drink herbal tea throughout the day and at uh, dinner, almost no matter what we're cooking, I'm going to dash out and find something, whether it's a sprig of parsley. Um, last night it was a little bit of oregano. We chopped into rice and had burritos. Um, so the adding herbs to every dish you make really just creates kind of a whole new level of, of uh, flavor and excitement to, to what, your what your dishes are. And right now a lot of us are cooking at home, right? So we could probably use a little spicing up of some old dishes we've been using up the last couple of weeks. <clears throat> so that is, um, that's enough on basil at the moment. There are multiple varieties in stock. More basil comes throughout the season. Um, and one to kind of watch for is a really cool variety called Pesto Perpetuo. Pesto Perpetuo. It's actually a variegated leaf basil, so it's got a smaller leaf shaped similar to the Thai basil, but it's white and green, two-toned. It has a little bit of an anise flavor to it, but it does not go to flower and it doesn't go to seed. So it kind of has a unique um, nature to it, where it just grows into a big bush and gives you a great crop of basil for the rest of the season. The handout is going to be posted uh, as a blog at the um, in the comments after the class, so I apologize that I have one and you don't. Um, but there will be lots of information on the handout that includes a little bit of cultural or historical background on herbs. I mean, some herbs have been grown since like BCE, right? Um, you'll also have cooking tips and storage tips and growing tips. So um, for each of the herbs that we're talking about, you're going to have a little bit of information on how to best keep them, how to maybe what you know, how to use it. But experiment—that's really the best way to grow herbs. Now, <clears throat> cilantro is another one of those annual herbs. Cilantro differs from basil. I've very rarely found people who don't like basil. Cilantro has two camps. You like it or you dislike it. Um, now I've under, I understand that that is actually in our genetics. Um, so it's kind of like uh, earlobe shape and you know whether you can turn your tongue into a taco and all of those weird like genetical inherited traits that we have. Uh, so either you like cilantro and your family probably also likes cilantro, which is a good thing or you don't like cilantro and you're in a family that doesn't tend to do cilantro. For some people it actually tastes uh, metallic or even soapy, and I know you're out there, so um, bear with me or mute me while I talk about cilantro. Cilantro is a cool season herb, <clears throat> and that's kind of the, the cruelest reality about cilantro, is that it likes cool weather, but we associate cilantro with like um, salsa and tomatoes and hot peppers, a lot of warm dishes and warm season dishes. So often we're putting cilantro out in warmer, hotter weather than cilantro would prefer. And if you're growing in your garden um, some cilantro or hoping to grow it, if you kind of watch where some taller plants are and where they throw maybe late afternoon shade, if you grew your cilantro in the afternoon shade, of your tomato plants, for example, that would give them a little bit of relief from the heat of the day um, and, and hopefully keep your cilantro from doing that same, you know, hurrying up, going to flower and forming a seed. That action, forming a flower and a seed, is you can see it happen because the plant that was low and bushy suddenly starts to grow taller. It makes a little tower of a tall, long stem, and that stem is going to become a flower. 
Now you can try to pinch it out um, and buy yourself some time and a lot of us do that with basil and cilantro when we see blooms forming, pinch them out. It really doesn't, it, it'll set the plant back a little bit but it keeps wanting to form a flower so it seems like you know inside the plant something has happened already and you can't turn back time in that sense. But the good news on cilantro flowers is again not only are they a highly attractive flower to our native bees and pollinators but cilantro flowers form seed that not only will just fall into the garden and sow itself to grow more cilantro for you either later that season or they come up in the spring but you could also collect and harvest the cilantro seed and bring those into the cupboard and add them to a spice jar and instead of cilantro on the jar it'll say coriander seed because that's exactly what cilantro seed is so coriander is used in kind of some different dishes either as whole um, or as a ground um, kind of a ground powder um, but coriander is often associated with a lot of um, Indian and Eastern dishes as well as some great Mexican food so cilantro coriander what happens if it goes to seed, you know, start over or let it fall and it'll re or harvest it and bring it in, have some coriander instead. Cilantro and basil are both um, not very flavorful when dried. So these are the herbs that are best um, used fresh and um, then anything that you don't have that you've picked or at the end of the season, create pesto. Um, and cilantro pesto, again, if you're a fan of cilantro, cilantro pesto um, kicks butt. It's really tasty. Um, great on a uh, piece of bread with like smoked mozzarella for that fall flavor. Ugh, love it. Um, the couple of herbs that uh, are also in that annual category, I don't have any to really like flip around and show you today, but dill, um, dill is a well-known, you know, kind of annual herb. Most of us either, again, use dill and know dill because we like pickles and um, that fermented flavor. Dill is a slightly funny herb. It doesn't blend with a lot of other herbs very well. Dill has a kind of a dominant flavor. It's unique and it's best used primarily on its own. Um, we would add dill to eggs or dill to egg salad. Um, dill's great with some um, vegetables and, and other meat dishes, but usually that is the primary herb when we're cooking or using dill. We're not mixing it up with a lot of others. Uh, dill can grow quite tall. So in a single season, it can get up to three, four feet tall. Beautiful feathery uh, foliage on dill that kind of just makes you want to pet it, you know, as you go along. Um, and dill is uh, likely to form a flower late in the season, which means that um, before it forms a flower, you can use the foliage of dill as a milder flavoring in, you know, casseroles and salads and things. But then later on, either pick the whole flower head as it's forming seed or harvest the seed. And now you have dill seed, which again can be added to breads, um, casserole dishes with kind of a stronger, more intense flavor. Um, so when it goes to flower, the flower is loved by butterflies. Um, and uh, so you'll get a lot of visitors to the um, dill flower when it's open. And then once it does form seed, you've got a whole nother crop to harvest as well. <clears throat> On to some of the more perennial herbs. Um, and we're gonna start with one of the like uh, herbs to be on your watch list and and this is you know I said herbs are easy to grow and herbs take very little care and herbs are uh, easy to grow well this is mint and mint is not only easy to grow but mint is kind of easy to lose control of so when most people buy mint they either are given a word of caution by a fellow gardener, maybe even a garden center worker, or they know on their own uh, to not put mint in the ground. Um, so once mint goes into the ground, it really tends to kind of colonize a large space and spread. Uh, even when you think you've dug out the mint that has kind of run out of control, a little piece in the ground tends to grow back and here you have mint again. So mint is best uh, kept in a container, grown in a pot, so that it doesn't take over the rest of your garden. Uh, and the cool, another cool thing about mint is it is where most of our other herbs like full sun 
Mint is tolerant of quite a bit of shade and will also grow in fairly moist soil. So if you have a wetter patch where those Mediterranean herbs won't grow, they want that well-draining soil, mint is going to do um, great in that area. And as far as kinds of mint, um, there's, there's two main kinds of mint. So there's peppermint and there's spearmint. Now, um, you can see kind of visually, you can see a difference between the two herbs just in their kind of profile as well as in their coloration. Uh, and an easy way to remember, at least for me, is, you know, pepper, right? Pepper is kind of spicy. So peppermint has a higher menthol content uh, in it. So it has even a little bit of heat and sometimes comes across as a spicier flavor can be more dominant in dishes when you use it. So um, peppermint is often used more in uh, foot soaks and you know more medicinal or in a tea where you really want that mint flavor where spearmint has a milder flavor. Um, I just made a spring greens soup recently and one of the um, herb ingredients in the green soup was spearmint. Um, but if I had used peppermint, I think it would have had too dominant of a flavor. So spearmint's a little bit sweeter. Spearmint is probably what you'll be, you know, muddling into your mojitos this summer. Um, I know I will. And um, mint in general, my spearmint, one of my favorite things to do with it, aside from what I just said, is um, making homemade mint ice cream. And so uh, I'll just quickly tell you this because it's worth the time. If you have an ice cream maker at home or however you make ice cream, you know, whatever that's on you. The way that you put the mint into it is not gonna chop up a bunch of mint leaves and throw it in there, that's not gonna go. Um, but you're gonna infuse the mint into the milk that you make for your ice cream. So you're gonna make a, a regular uh, vanilla recipe and then as you're heating the milk and you put some sugar in there or whatever, then you drop in a good handful of cut fresh mint leaves. They can be on the stem even. Drop them in the milk the milk comes up to, uh, you know, before a boil, you don't let it boil, and turn it off and let that mint leaf uh, sprig or those sprigs sit in the water for a good 20 minutes, and milk for a good 20 minutes or so. And you'll smell it. I mean, the heat and the fats that are in the milk start to really bring the essential oils out of the mint. And then you can kind of uh, tweezer out the mint sprigs. They're all wilty and done now. They've given their essential oils into the milk and you can just smell that milk and it just smells like minty milk. Then you just pour that in your ice cream maker. Uh, it's, as, it's not green, so if you have to have green minty ice cream, a little food coloring or whatever, um, but best homemade mint ice cream ever. Just tastes like it came right out of the garden. Spearmint uh, and all mints are in a pretty large family that is uh, easily distinguished all mints have a square stem. So as you as you look at the plant and you roll the stem kind of in your hands, I don't think the detail is gonna come on the video, but go out and look at your mint. It doesn't have a round stem. It has ridges or edges um, and four distinct sides. So all plants in the mint family have square stems. Uh, and they all tend to be a little bit on the spreading or aggressive spreading side. So keep an eye on mint for all of those reasons. Mint makes a great simple syrup as well, so um, that would be another one of those things that you would add to your mojitos or add to almost any like um, iced tea or f you know flavored summer drink, even water. Um, and so a little bit later in class, we're going to talk about how to make a simple syrup, but remember mint for that as well. Mint is not really evergreen, so it does die back in the winter time, um, but quickly regrows. And as you can see in the peppermint. I didn't even mention, this isn't just peppermint, guys. This is chocolate mint. Yeah, it smells like a peppermint patty. Mm. But look at this guy coming out of the edge. So this is like, uh, um, this is the forward team looking for new territory on the mint plant. So it's full in the pot from edge to edge. It's already spread in here. And now it's sent out a runner that wants to go colonize a whole new plot of land. That's what mint does, um, and that's why we want to keep track of it and be careful and not let it spread in the garden. Oh, oregano. You, uh, it, 
you may or may not use a lot of oregano in cooking. It's one of those herbs that you know we are aware of, um, and most of us have a jar of dried bits that says it's oregano. We also kind of know it's in like spaghetti sauce and a lot of Italian dishes. Oregano goes great with tomatoes. So um, I was, several years ago, I was kind of surprised to find that um, I was exploring uh, cooking some Mexican dishes and I found that there's a lot of oregano used in Mexican dishes and Mexican cooking as well. So um, it's really one of those herbs that can go into varied cuisines uh, and blends beautifully with a lot of other herbs. So um, not only is oregano a perennial, hardy perennial herb, it's drought tolerant, grows best in sun to even partial shade. Oregano is in the mint family. It also has square stems and it can spread somewhat, um, but it's never been as aggressive and as much of a problem as I've seen mint be. So I let oregano live in the ground and spread around in my garden. And I'm always sort of amazed at where I find it and how much shade it can take. So I have found oregano growing underneath my deck, um, which uh, I just harvested and said, that's not a good place for you. So we picked it and ate it. Um, that's what happens when you go in the wrong place, you get eaten. But oregano flowers uh, through the summer, and although the flavor of oregano doesn't change when it blooms, uh, its flavor is at its peak right before it blooms. Most oregano have pink uh, flowers that are also attractive to pollinators and butterflies. And um, you can use it fresh, you can use it dried. Oregano has a great um, staying power as far as uh, the long-lasting flavor of dried oregano. And if the flavor, it's soft and fuzzy too, which is why I can't not pet it. Um, the flavor of oregano, if it's a little intense for you, the, um, there's a similar herb called majorum, which has a similar flavor to oregano, but it's just a little bit milder in its intensity. Um, both of them beautiful herbs, hardy, um, perennial, and even semi-evergreen kind of a low mound, but uh, with its flowers, oregano can get up to two to three feet tall and make a nice patch. <clears throat> oregano um, is also believed to stimulate the appetite, alleviate colic, facilitates digestion, and is thought to have a beneficial effect on the respiratory system. So even more reasons to add oregano to your diet. Um, and talking about an herb that is a powerhouse of health. Herbs are healthy for you. In addition, I mean, not only do they spice up your food and taste good, but most herbs have a lot of uh, minerals and vitamins. And parsley, who would have thought? Parsley was jam-packed full of vitamins. Check this out. I can't even memorize this, so you'll see it on your handout. More vitamin A than carrots. More vitamin C than... Uh, then oranges, more vitamin C than oranges, more iron than a lot of our uh, darker leafy greens, and also a lot of minerals, so like trace minerals in parsley. Now we're looking at curled parsley or flat leaf Italian parsley. Um, a lot of us associate parsley, the curled especially, with just that one green thing that was on your plate when you go out to a fancy restaurant. You push it around um, and then it's still there when they come and pick up your plate to take it away. Shame on you. You should be eating your parsley. Not only now because you know that it's like a little vitamin pack on your plate, but parsley also uh, aids in digestion and it makes your breath better. Um, so when you finish that meal, you may have a you know garlic mouth or whatever. Maybe you're on a date, maybe you're going somewhere else put the parsley in your mouth and chew it up and swallow it. You're gonna have a better flavor in your mouth and everybody around you is gonna be happier for it. Now I also know someone who gives parsley to their dog because their dog has stink breath. Um, check with your veterinarian, but um, her dog loves it and uh, she loves that her dog loves it too. So parsley is a neat plant because it's not an annual like basil, like cilantro. It's not a perennial like rosemary like oregano parsley is a biennial what the heck is that well a biennial lives for two years 
And so uh, this is what maybe if you're on year two with your parsley, this is what your future holds. Parsley on year two goes to seed, so it does that what we call bolting. It's gonna bolt up with that long stalk, looks tall all of a sudden. It's going to make a flower. You know who likes flowers? Butterflies, love it. Afterwards, parsley is gonna go to seed. If it's in your garden, the seed will fall on the ground just like it should in nature. You didn't plant it, you don't have to bury it, you leave it alone. Parsley will grow back next year as the babies from the plant that sowed the seed. But when the plant, after the plant goes to seed, that plant dies. So the first year of a biennial is kind of like, um, honestly, I can't think of any other way to put it. It's like pre-puberty. Uh, year one, you can't reproduce. So pre-puberty. Year two is this is your year to reproduce. So that's what parsley does in year two. And then when it's finished reproducing, this whole goal in life is achieved and that plant dies. So biennials live for two years. It's a good idea to either sow parsley seed two years in a row so that you can kind of um, start your bed, start your parsley crop. And then the second year you'll have parsley crop that may be sowing seed. So then you put in another parsley crop that year so that every year you can kind of keep that year one group as parsley that you can harvest and eat. And the year two group is the one that'll make the flowers and seed to then kind of perpetuate your crop, if that makes sense. Parsley um, is also best dried, uh, but we do use it a lot in, um, dry, it, it, excuse me, best fresh, but we do use a lot in dried form. And I use parsley a lot in just green, just as a green. Um, so in addition to uh, grabbing some salads and lettuce greens out of my garden, I will grab a handful or a few sprigs of parsley. You can use the stem as well as the leaf. Um, and then parsley makes a great pesto too, but I'll even just throw it into a little pitcher of water, um, maybe slice a cucumber or so into that, and then have a nice flavored water that we can drink uh, throughout the you know, week in the refrigerator. So parsley, um, if it does go to seed though, let the volunteers um, grow back for you and um, you'll have parsley for, for years. Sage, oh yeah, I had, I had this line up because we were talking about this, right? So parsley, sage, sing with me, rosemary and thyme, right? So um, yes, it's true, all these herbs go together, grow together, um, we can sing about it and if they're worth singing about, um, sage, is one of the oldest herbs uh, in, in culinary use. So sage uh, also is found almost all over the world. There are like 900 species of sage. We often know them as flowering perennials in our garden that we, we call salvia probably because we're sophisticated. And then we've got the culinary sage uh, that is just sage, right? So. Sage comes in a variety of leaf colors to kind of add pizzazz and attractiveness to the garden. This is golden sage. This is kind of the most traditional garden sage um, called Biergarten sage here, but bigger, fuzzier leaf, solid green. And then in my little herb container up here, you even see this pretty tricolor sage. So a little pink, a little green, a little creamy edge. And the tricolor sage is actually forming a little flower bud. So it'll be blooming soon and sage has pretty little purple flowers. So um, I guess I should also mention almost all of these herb flowers are just as edible as the herbs themselves. And so if you want to like throw some flower petals into a salad or something and now you're looking at an herb that has gone to flower, pick the blooms, pick off the petals and scatter those into your salad or uh, sandwich or whatever, they're, they're fun to add. Now, sage is uh, an evergreen herb, mostly associated with Mediterranean weather or Mediterranean conditions, so it is um, drought tolerant and wants really well draining soil. It also has a fairly strong flavor, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, so it is, um, it's associated a lot with, again, meat dishes, um, but pasta is wonderful with some pasta dishes, goes well 
when you pick individual leaves and kind of quickly uh, fry or saute them in oil and have a little crispy sage leaf makes a great snack. Um, sage is also used with um, companion planting. So if you plant sage amongst um, cabbage, you can make the cabbage more succulent and it also tends to ward off the cabbage butterfly or the cabbage moth. So um, companion planting with some, some herbs can also do beneficial things for the community around them as the other plants benefit. And even planting herbs like in front of, here I have a couple of beautiful rose bushes with me today. Um, not only do I have roses here to talk about the fact that rose petals are edible in flowers as well, but it, roses are kind of traditionally bothered by some pests, including even deer that might want to come and eat roses. So if you can plant some herbs around your rose garden, as the deer approach the herb garden, they will encounter the smelly herbs first, and in many cases be somewhat repelled by that, um, believe it or not. I know, we think, oh wow, those herbs smell great, but a deer is like, ugh. I don't like this place, and they just might take you off the menu and spare your rose. Um, so that would be good for everybody. Sage can be damaged by extreme cold um, as well. So if we do get a hard winter, um, your sage could be damaged. You can cut it back, but really, some of these herbs, they work so hard. A lot of the evergreen herbs, rosemary, lavender, sage, thyme as well. Uh, they're evergreen, they're out all the time they end up being somewhat short-lived for that reason. So I would consider a good run for a lot of those evergreen Mediterranean herbs if they lasted and lived for seven, six, seven years. And then maybe that herb is kind of woody looking. It may have gotten larger than you intended. Uh, it's probably slowed down in its production of essential oils. So then you could go ahead and you know discard the plant, uh, replant with something new, or even take cuttings um, and replant the cuttings. And speaking of thyme, thyme, ornamental thyme, uh, and close to time to wrap this class up, I'm sure. Um, ornamental thyme is uh, one of my favorite herbs. It's it's easy to grow. It's low and um, tolerates partial shade. It's somewhat, uh, it's got a low mounting habit, but it also spill over on a container. So none of our thyme is actually spilling over yet, but we have some thyme in this little container that's even showing its little pink flowers. Up here, we'll get a close up of this. We have lemon variegated thyme. There is, uh, that's a gold and green. There's silver variegated thyme, <clears throat> which is a white and green leaf. This is just regular culinary thyme. This is a French thyme. English thyme, German thyme. Again, there's lots of different thymes and fun to kind of experiment with their flavors. Um, thyme, culinary thyme, you'll find usually with the herbs, but you also encounter thyme in our ground cover options as a really nice kind of selection of uh, ground covers that stay low and uh, steppable. But as you step on that wonderful thyme, it releases a really nice aroma uh, as well. So even though those ground cover times we don't think of as culinary use, they're in the same family and have that same great aroma. Thyme is great with mushrooms um, and makes a fantastic companion herb to even just a simple dish of sauteed mushrooms or an egg dish um, where you're adding mushrooms as well. <clears throat> and now, <coughs> excuse me, let's talk about simple syrups and how we use some of these herbs. So, um, Coming in with a wad full of green things and my printers on me is like, dinner's almost ready and here's what we're adding. You know, bring it in and put it on a cutting board. Um, what have you got? Uh, just chop it all up together and throw it in. Uh, really just kind of adds a lot to no matter what you're cooking. But if you are harvesting towards the end of the season um, or before something goes to flower and you've got a decent batch of herbs more than you could eat fresh, uh, turning it into, again, pesto, as I mentioned, or making simple syrups is one of the greatest ways to then store that flavorful, the flavor of the herb, basically, in your refrigerator for several weeks. So a simple syrup is um, parts sugar and water. So let's just say a half cup sugar, half cup water. Put it into a saucepan on like medium heat, and you're going to now melt the, or dissolve the sugar in the water. So you want to stir that. 
And once the sugar has, has uh, emulsified or you know, melted into the water, then you can add your herbs. So there are basically kind of two, uh, two types of herbs as far as texture goes. And we're just gonna say um, there's the floppy herbs, right? And then there's the woodier herbs. Oh, that was a good demonstration. Yeah, so woody herbs, thyme, sage, rosemary, lavender, um, floppier herbs, basil, cilantro, mint, tarragon. Um, the floppier herbs will give their flavor to the sugar water faster. So you don't have to let them like seep, like you're making tea. You throw those herbs in, several sprigs into the hot sugar water and let them sit in for maybe 10 or 15 minutes, just dissolving their, or releasing their essential oils. And then you can remove the wilted herbs, discard, and, and you'll even smell it. You'll smell like, oh, now it's rosemary syrup, um, lavender syrup. It's sweet, so that means that that adds like a sweetener to an iced tea or something like that. Um, it's great for mixing with cocktails or mocktails. Um, I love uh, thyme teeny, uh, so a little martini with thyme simple syrup. Um, I make even, you can use fruits to make simple syrups as well. So one of my favorites is a, well, it's fun to say as well, but a rhubarb margarita, or we just call it a rhubarb margarita. Um, so, you know, really you can have a lot of fun with simple syrups. They can be um, squirted over uh, fresh fruit as well. So just dice that fresh fruit with like a mint simple syrup. Uh, kids are going to love it and it just kind of creates a whole different element to the things that you're eating. And that syrup can be stored in your refrigerator, in a mason jar or whatever for several weeks. Um, so it's a great way to keep that fresh flavor and that fresh herb for longer. You will see also on your handout um, my peppermint foot soak. These days, I'm putting on a lot of steps every day at the garden center. You better believe at least a couple times a week I'm going home to put my feet in peppermint foot soak. This is like better, this is saying a lot, better than my slippers. And it's oh so easy to prepare. So you will see um, a, a great recipe for peppermint, which is a stimulant. So it's going to aid in, in circulation, you know, when your feet are just dog tired and tingly and this will get all ready to, you know, hop out in the garden maybe before sunset. Um, I'm also giving a recipe for herbal housekeeping spray. So that uses rosemary and thyme because both of those herbs have disinfecting qualities as well. Um, so a lot of us are getting a little tired of the bleach smell, um, which I know I am. Adding even some herbs to your regular household sprays, uh, if you have them unscented at least, is going to help just bring a different flavor to the house. I mean, a lot of us are already aware of the benefits of aromatherapy, um, and herbs really can add a lot to that. <clears throat> the um, other kind of fun things to do with herbs, herb-infused water, and you'll also see in the handout, herb-infused vodka, herb-infused alcohol, um, which really kind of steps up all of your uh, seasonal cocktail making or mocktail making uh, to just kind of create concoctions with all of the things that you've grown in your garden to find ways to then add that to a beverage, a salad, uh, a dessert um, with all of these fun opportunities. Um, in addition to that, you'll also have in the handout edible flowers. Um, so beautiful herbs to know. Um, herbs with exceptionally showy flowers, catmint, pineapple sage. So again, in that sage family, um, this is pineapple sage. It smells, it smells just like pineapple. And although it's not as, it doesn't taste as much like pineapple, it tastes more like sage, it smells like pineapple. Pineapple sage is grown almost more for the flower that it makes. Um, so you can, I'll zoom in on this. The flower is this bright red tubular flower that comes off of a fairly good sized plant in late summer, early fall that just blows hummingbirds minds. Um, so if you need more hummingbirds in your life, um, I'm talking to you, if you need more hummingbirds in your life like I do, um, pineapple sage and a lot of other plants in the sage family will bring them home. Um, so definitely adding pineapple sage and it's, oh, it smells so good. So pineapple sage is fun for an edible 
flower and fabulous for showy flowers. Little marigolds. I mean, they belong in the garden for so many different reasons, but marigold flowers and the petals of marigolds are edible. Um, now, as long as, again, you do everything to grow them organically, you're going to have this nutritious, organic, colorful source. They're not adding a lot of flavor. They're adding pizzazz. Um, and we all need pizzazz. So throw some flowers in your food and you'll be better off for it as well. So marigolds are edible. Uh, this is not a blooming plant at the moment, but calendula, which often old fashioned terms are pot marigold. Um, turns out a pot marigold or a calendula was used by the monks uh, in monasteries in like medieval times. They would throw the petals of pot marigolds or calendula into their porridge to thicken the soup. Um, so it can be used for uh, culinary tricks of the trade, um, as well as again, adding some color to your diet. Uh, and it's fun, kids love eating flowers. So, you know, maybe they'll eat more vegetables if there's flowers in there. Uh, and then the last one, any of the carnation or dianthus family, um, not only mm, clovey, kind of a strong spicy clovey fragrance to the flower, but the flower petals of uh, dianthus and carnations, also edible flowers. Roses, as I mentioned earlier, and then um, pansies and violas. So we have these really fun herb containers. There's a ton of herbs in here. Uh, so we have parsley, rosemary, oregano, front row, thyme, tricolored sage, and then a little uh, blooming edible flower pansy. Oh my gosh, and there's a chive tucked in the back there, snuck in. So a ton of herbs in here. These guys are not gonna be able to live all in this container together for the long term. Um, so we are gonna grow them in a pot like this for the first year to keep them all kind of convenient and easy. But by next spring, these herbs would need to be, maybe a, a half or a third of them could stay in this pot. The rest of them would either need to be planted into the ground or into another container. Um, but these are great to start off your herb garden. 25 bucks for a collection of herbs like this that you could just put right on your patio or table and start cooking the day. But when we're looking for more long-term um, containers, as I mentioned, these terracotta pots are great. They come in a lot of different sizes. The little shallow bowls are fun. <laughs> but for any kind of perennial herb that's gonna live for year after year, this size container or even larger, um, many of us have walked past a rosemary that we could look eye to eye at. So um, we need a bigger pot for a bigger plant to grow in. So rosemary could grow nicely into a container like this on your patio or your deck. The same with um, things like bay, bay laurel, which um, those of us that you know make pasta sauce and things are always using bay. And um, catnip and chamomile. Not at the end of the alphabet, but at the end of the class. More just again beneficial herbs. Both of these are more of a sedative, uh, probably better known in tea, um, but also great herbs to have around. Uh, if you've been paying attention and you've come and take a look at something like catnip, you will see it has square stems, and now you also know what that means. So catnip can spread a little bit in the garden because it's in the mint family, um, but fun to just even start being able to recognize family members um, in the herb family as one another. So um, I hope that that's all enriching and informative and that it spiced up your day today. Uh, happy gardening. Thanks for watching. Thank you. The handout will be attached shortly and the video will be posted to our feed. Have a great day.